It's the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. Venezuela's presidential elections are taking place this coming Sunday, May 20th. Even though Venezuela is going through one of its worst economic crises in history at the moment with hyperinflation and ongoing shortages of basic consumer items, it appears that President Maduro has a good chance of being re-elected. One of the reasons is because large part of Venezuela's main opposition groups under the advisement of the United States are calling for a boycott of Sunday's vote. Meanwhile, the Trump administration is saying it won't recognize the vote anyway and that it might impose new sanctions in Venezuela. Here's Vice President Mike Pence at the Organization of American States on May 7th. Yet more than any other nation in our hemisphere, in Venezuela, the tragedy of tyranny is on full display. And the blame can be laid squarely at the feet of one man, Nicolas Maduro. The so-called elections in Venezuela scheduled for May the 20th will be nothing more than a fraud and a sham. In short, there will be no real election in Venezuela on May 20th, and the world knows it. We've already imposed strict financial sanctions on more than 50 current and former senior Venezuelan officials. We cut off the so-called Petro from the United States financial system, and today, uh, I am pleased to announce the United States is designating three Venezuelans with direct ties to the Maduro regime as narcotics kingpins. We have frozen their assets, blocked their access to our nation so they can no longer poison our people with their deadly drugs. Joining me now to analyze Venezuela's upcoming presidential election is Steve Elner. He was a professor of history at the Universidad de Oriente in Puerto La Cruz, Venezuela. And he is the author of numerous books, and the most recent among them is Latin America's Radical Left, Challenges and Complexities of Political Power. Thanks for joining us, Steve. Being the program, Sean. All right, Steve, uh, as you can see, Steve is joining us via broadband. So, Steve, let's start off with your impressions of the campaign. The two main candidates, and uh, uh, one is President Nicolas Maduro, who is the incumbent representing the United Socialist Party of Venezuela, and opposition candidate Henry Falcon. Has either of these candidates, Steve, managed to garner much enthusiasm as far as their candidacy is concerned? concern. Uh, what is happening on the ground? Yeah, I, I think that uh, there is considerable enthusiasm to the degree that uh, Venezuela is very much split in three camps. Uh, and the people who are supporting Falcon seem to be pretty gung-ho. They're not people who identify with Falcon. They're not members of his party. Uh, they belong to other parties or they're independent. But there is a three-way uh, split now, and that is interesting because it represents a fundamental change for Venezuela, the Venezuelan political system. Uh, the time that Chavez was elected, actually before he was elected in 1998, Venezuela became very polarized between the opposition, uh, which was pretty much dominated by the radicals in the opposition, who did not recognize Chavez's legitimacy as president, uh, and the Chavistas. So there was a polarization, two camps. Now, as of last year, uh, ever since Falcon um, recognized the outcome of the elections for governor in October of last year, uh, um, and thus broke with the opposition, which refused to recognize those those results and the legitimacy of that process, you now have a three three way system. You have uh, three points of reference. The radical opposition, the Falcon people, uh, and the Chavistas. All right. Now, um, many opposition parties, as I mentioned in the introduction, are boycotting the vote. Um, what is their official explanation for the boycott, and what do you think of their arguments? 
Well, firstly, you you mentioned in your introductory remarks that the opposition is influenced by the position of the Trump administration. Um, they they kind of vacillated. They were negotiating with the government, and the government was accepting some of their demands. One of which was uh, holding elections um, at an earlier date. They were scheduled for December of 2018. So. Uh, um, when the United States took a hardline position, the, most of the parties of the opposition uh, decided to not participate in the elections. Nevertheless, one of the historical parties, one of the two main historical parties in Venezuela, COPE, the Christian Democratic Party, uh, is participating. They're supporting um, Falcon, uh, and, not, and one of their historical leaders, Eduardo Fernandez, I don't know whether he's still a member of COPE, but he is a very outspoken supporter of Falcon and critic of the, of the so-called radical opposition. Um, the campaign manager uh, for Falcon is Claudia Fermin, who's another historical leader. Uh, so you do, you do have a three-way split, and it, Falcon is far from being an isolated figure. All right. Now, um, in terms of the parties that are not participating in this uh, election, Steve, uh, do you think the boycott is going to have an impact uh, on this election in terms of the number of people obviously showing up at the polling stations and then, of course, the credibility of the results? Yeah, uh, well, those, those are two questions. Uh, I think uh, the abstention policy of the Opposite, the radical opposition is going to have a big impact because uh, if Maduro does win, and according to the surveys, uh, and in, uh, one of the questions that, uh, that is asked is, who do you think is going to win? And the vast majority of Venezuelans, for one reason or another, believe that Maduro will win. Uh, so that the uh, policy of uh, uh, boycotting the elections uh, is going to have a big impact. It's going to mean that Maduro is is probably going to win so that's unquestionable um whether that uh, influences the legitimacy and the general perception of legitimacy of the elections i think uh, that depends on two unknowns one is whether falcon if he does lose whether he will recognize the, the legitimacy of the elections like he did uh, on October 15th, as I mentioned before, when he was defeated by a Chavista in the state of Lada. He was the governor, uh, and he was defeated, uh, and he immediately recognized that those elections were legitimate. If he were to do that, I think that would have a big impact, uh, because behind him, as I mentioned before, are important historical political leaders and a number of local leaders who belong to all the political parties, Primero Justicia, Acción Democrática, Un Nuevo Tiempo, a lot of the local leaders uh, have broken with their respective leaderships and are supporting uh, Falcón at the local level. So that's one factor. And the other factor is, if Maduro does win, I think it's going to be very significant whether he wins by one or two percentage points or whether he wins by more than five. Um, you know, in 2013, Maduro defeated Capriles in the elections after Chavez's death. Uh, those elections were held in April of 2013. And Maduro won by 1.5 percentage points. And Capriles did not recognize the legitimacy of those results. So if the difference between Maduro and Falcón were to be of that uh, uh, nature, of between 1 and 2 percentage points, uh, that, that would be a game changer. That, that would be quite different, qualitatively speaking, than if Maduro were to win by five or more percentage points. All right. Uh, now, Steve, one of the main reasons uh, that Venezuela is in such a great crisis at the moment is the economic problems that continue to be rather serious. The IMF believes that inflation will reach 1,000% this year, and the economy has already shrunk uh, in the past few years, um, past three years to be specific. Um, who are the Venezuelans blaming this on in terms of the uh, uh, situation that most people are in, in terms of scarcity of food and the inflation? and uh, and the struggles that they are going through. Uh, 
Again, there is a three-way split. The people in the opposition are claiming that it's Maduro's fault, uh, mistaken policies. The Chavistas blame the financial boycott of the Trump administration. Um, I, I believe that it also has to do with the Obama decree as well, because it signaled um, a policy of non-investment. Uh, U.S. companies that uh, have investments in Venezuela did not uh, expand on those investments. So that that is what the Chavistas are saying. And the Falcon people are saying both things. Uh, you know, uh, Francisco Rodriguez, who is the economic advisor to Falcon, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and is really his right-hand man in these uh, elections, uh, has stated in an article in Foreign Affairs that the Trump boycott, the Trump financial uh, embargo on Venezuela, which prohibits U.S. financial institutions, um, prohibits them from. Um, lending credit to the Venezuelan government, to this state oil company, uh, that that has had, according to, to Rodriguez, who's, you know, as I said before, in the opposition, he's with Falcon, and he says in that article that it has had a tremendous impact. Uh, last year it had a very big impact on the Venezuelan economy. So that, that's pretty much what the Falcon people are saying. They're saying that mistaken policies on the part of Maduro, but also the economic measures um, of the Trump administration. And I may say that there seems to be somewhat of a contradiction in the Trump administration's discourse, because the Trump administration talks about hum a humanitarian crisis. Now, the Chavistas would say that's overstating it, but nobody denies that the situation here in, Vene in Venezuela is, is, is very difficult. Um, but uh, on the one hand, they say there's a humanitarian crisis. On the other hand, uh, economic sanctions, uh, which affects the Venezuelan economy. All right. A um, couple of points you just made, Steve, um, about uh, the sanctions and uh, the impact this is having on the ground. Um, give us a sense of what day-to-day -day life is like in Venezuela as a result of these sanctions, because often, you know, sam sanctions for ordinary people seems very, um, you know, disconnected, abstract. Uh, but these sanctions are having a serious impact on the people, not only in terms of the credit ratings that the Venezuela has, but in terms of lending, in terms of being able to do business, in terms of being able to have uh, contracts to to extract the oil uh, and so forth. Give us a sense of those factors as well as the impact it's having on the ground. Certainly. Uh, you know, uh, when major U.S. companies pull out of Venezuela, uh, as Ford uh, company did, they just closed shop and left, as did Clorox, uh, as did Cumberly Clark, right at the time of the Obama decree. The Obama decree, which stated that Venezuela was a threat uh, to U.S. national security, an extraordinary threat to U.S. national security. And so the pulling out uh, of such major companies naturally is going to affect the Venezuelan economy. The fact, and this is a point that Rodriguez makes in that foreign affairs article, that Venezuela, under normal circumstances, a country in such dire straits is going to uh, get an extension on their loans, their foreign loans. Well, the Trump administration's financial embargo doesn't allow U.S. institutions or anyone in the United States, be it U.S. citizens or anybody else, uh, to lend money to the Venezuelan government. So they cannot uh, get an extension on their loans they can't sell bonds to people in the United States in order to refinance their, their, their debt. So naturally, these measures have had a major impact. With regard to what's happening on the ground, um, uh, you mentioned the inflation. Uh, that's a major problem. Uh, uh, there is... Um, a scarcity uh, of goods, uh, basic goods uh, that people need. A scarcity of goods. Now, I'll say that, that that is also a problem. It was worse before. What the Maduro government did was they allowed 
for increased prices on some commodities, uh, and that did have effect. I mean, the the the, the market the market is uh, cannot be ignored, and this is one of the c- uh, critical uh, comments that I make with regard to the uh, um, uh, Maduro administration. They don't seem to recognize the importance of the market, and they have established price controls, which I would say are justifiable, but not when you have a situation in which there's such a big disparity between the price of a commodity in the, on a black market, for instance, or the price of a commodity in neighboring Colombia and the price uh, of the commodity uh, as a result of uh, uh, price controls in Venezuela. The same, I mean, the, the, the most um, uh, uh, incredible example of that is gasoline, which is practically free here in Venezuela. So you have uh, in the case of gasoline, in the case of gas, in the case of electricity, to a certain extent, telephone service as well, you have a very big disparity between the cost of production and the prices. So th- that that has um, now uh, the scarcity is not quite as intense, but uh, there is a scarcity of, of some products. Uh, but the, pro- the major problem is inflation at this point. All right. I thank you so much for joining us today, Steve, and uh, we'll definitely be back to you uh, right after the election on Sunday. By all means, Shamini. And thank you for joining us here on The Real News Network.